So welcome to the new a new EBD series seminar. Uh, today we, we are gonna I'm gonna introduce uh, Jorge Isla. Uh, he is a PhD student at the Integrative Ecology Department here at the EBD. And my name is Irene Mendoza. And at the end of the talk, uh, we are gonna be the three of us presenting uh, the questions that you are gonna you can put in the chat of the YouTube channel to Jorge. We're going to be uh, Agustin Camacho, Maria Jose uh, Ruiz, and myself for presenting the questions to Jorge. So thank you so much, Jorge, for being here and have a good talk. Uh, hello. Thank you very much, Irene, for your presentation. And thank you to all the people that organized this, this seminar and also all the people that are connected here. Uh, today, I would like to talk about my, my thesis project. I am doing this thesis uh, in the Integrative Ecology Group of the Estación Biológica de Doñana. And now I am in the middle of, of my second year of thesis. I have a FFA fellowship from the Spanish Ministry. And I am doing this thesis uh, under the supervision of Pedro Jordano and Miguel Jacome. And my, my thesis and this presentation is titled Seed Dispersal by Animal Frugivores and Range Expansion in Plants, a Multilayer Network Approach. Mm, first of all, I would like to, to give you some, some short index of this presentation. The first step is uh, an introduction in the conceptual framework and the motivation uh, of this project. And the second step is a, an, an, a description of the analytical approach that we are going to use and, and the major hypothesis of this, of this thesis. And the next step is the presentation of the study species and, and our study design. And finally, in the last uh, part of the presentation and the major of the, of the presentation, I, I'm going to outline or explain a bit uh, the fourth chapters that, that shape uh, this thesis project. Well, in the starting with the conceptual framework, uh, as we know, there are several factors that uh, currently are, are promoting uh, global change. And obviously, natural species uh, respond. Uh, this, these changes have an effect in natural species. And from a plant perspective, from a, a plant population point of view, when a population uh, is in an unsuitable area uh, for their establishment, there are three main possibilities that can occur in nature. The, the, the first possibility is that uh, a local adaptation that, that avoid uh, the, the establishment of the species by some time of evolutionary change that improve the, the fitness of the individuals. The second option is that if there are not any type of adaptation, the, the fitness of the, of the individual is going to suffer a progressive uh, decrease in, in their fitness, and this could mean the local extinction of the populations. And the third point, and where we focus in this project, is the, the, the option of modify the, the population distribution to a more uh, suitable areas. And there are three main factors that uh, uh, currently are promoting the plant expansion and the uh, plant distribution shift uh, worldwide. The, the first of these three uh, factors uh, is the climate change. For example, the, the increase in the temperatures uh, is promoting that many plant species are migrating latitudinally their, their distribution. The other factor with a very important effect on plant movements, and here in Spain, uh, we are a very good example of this. There's the, the land abandonment of, of farmlands that facilitates the new recolonization of many um, of many areas for for many plant species, and the last one, and here also we have uh, in in Doñana a very good example is the protection by by conservation politics of new areas that promote the new organization and the new colonization of natural species of these of these areas. And as we already study any any plant movement processes uh, is a very uh, gradual uh, processes composed by different uh, successional stages that go from uh, the more mature and well-established uh, plant stands 
to that acts as a source of new of propagules from uh, the more younger population and finally uh, the colonization front. And in in more demographic or botanical terms, we know very well how how are these type of processes. But the point of this thesis is what happened with the with the interaction, the biotic interaction between plant and animals that are taking account during these processes. For example, some, some type of interaction, like for example, the seed dispersal by, by animal vectors could be very important, this mutualistic interaction facilitating this, these plant movements, but there are other type of interactions, for example, many type of antagonistic interactions that could um, constrain the, these mobilization processes. So um, one of the biggest questions of, of my thesis project is what is the role of the plant animal interaction in these plant colonization processes. And the more um, focusing on the plant animal interaction, the more obvious, uh, obviously, hypothesis that we can have is that the balance between the antagonistic and the mutualistic interactions is going to regulate the, the plant expansion processes. And between this type of, of, of interaction, the immediate hypothesis that we have is this one. Uh, that means that a decrease in the in the in the effect of the antagonistic interaction added to an increase in in mutualistics facilitates the plant expansion the plant expansion processes by improving the individual plant plant fitness. And the second one of this of this hypothesis that we have, because we have a, an individual point of view, not the species point of view, we focus on the individuals within a species, is that the mutualistic antagonistic balance will differ between individual plants due to the animal preferences and the landscape settings. And um, finally, our last hypothesis that we want to test here uh, in this project is more about the consequences of the, of the plant movement in genetic terms. And this is the hypothesis that different feeding and the position strategies by frugivores is going to determine the future plant genetic structure in, in heterogeneous landscapes. So as I, as I said you, the, the, the diversity of interactions between plants and animals could be, could be very diverse. Uh, here in this figure, I show some of the most important interaction that uh, taking part during a, a complete, during a complete life reproductive cycle of, a, of an individual plant. For example, it could be a um, different type of antagonistic interaction. For example, the, the vertebrate herbivory that feed on the, on the leaves of the plants or other antagonistic interaction, for example, acting in the predispersal states, the animals that feed or, or predate on the seeds uh, before the frugivory action or uh, the post-dispersal predation. And there are other mutualistic interactions, like for example, the, the effect of the frugivories, which is very important for us in the, in the plant movements. Uh, they have a very important effect in fitness consequences of the, of the contribution of, for the new uh, uh, plant colonization, or in other plants, not in our case, the, pollin the pollinator community could have a very, mutually, a mutual, a very important mutualistic effect. So um, the, the, inter the assemblage of each individual plant with the different types of animals and the strength of their interaction is going to determine um, the, the individual contribution uh, of a plant within a population for the new propagules uh, of the, of, during the colonization processes. And the analytical approach, <clears throat> one of the analytical approach that we are going to use in this thesis project, and I will explain it in, in more detail in, in the chapter fourth of this thesis project, is the, the multi-layer networks that allow us to analyze the different patterns of interactions in a biological or direct way, uh, analyzing not uh, each type of interaction um, uh, in a focused way, but moreover, uh, analyze the interaction in a more uh, comprehensive or generalistic point of view. 
and the, the classical network is going to be too a uh, very important tool during these these thesis because this type of approach allow us to understand how the interaction are structured in nature and what is the changes between the the, the interaction structured uh, between different habitats or in our case during the colonization processes here in this graph i am showing a bipartite network which is composed mainly by two types of nodes the the red points and the blue points and here in our case this is only an example uh, figure but here for example each red point uh, are represent uh, is representing um, animal species that interact with the blue points that in our case represent individual of one species mm, commonly in, in interaction network the more commonly um, um, scale is work with uh, plant species and, and animal species but in our case we have an individual based approach and each blue point uh, are representing uh, different individual plants and the the interaction between uh, each individual plant and the animals are represented by by these gray lines and the the strength of the of the interaction is represented by by the fat of the line and with this type of networks we can calculate different type of network metrics that allow us to understand how the interactions are structured to, to detect possible change in the, in the structuring of the interactions. And here I present you our study species. Uh, our study uh, species is the black juniper, the Juniperus foenicia. And we, we have selected this species for this project because in our, first of all, because it, it is considered as a, a foundation species in Mediterranean scrubland. And in our study area in Doñana, since the protection of this natural area 50 years ago, the juniper population have examined a very important uh, colonization or very important, very important increase in their distribution in the, in the national park. So this is, is, species is very useful for us to understand what happened with the interaction during the plant movement because uh, now it, the, their population uh, are in movements and the other motivation to choose the, these species is because the assemblage of interactions that occur in the in the juniper plants are very diverse in, in this case the, the herbivory community is not very important for the individual fitness of for the in the fitness of the individuals but for example juniper plants have a very diverse uh, assemblage of predispersal pre seed and pool predators. This is animals that feed in the seeds or in the pool of the, of the fruits uh, before the activity of the frugivory species. And juniper plants also have a diverse um, assemblage and very functional diverse assemblage of, of um, dispersal vectors of these animals uh, composed mainly by medium-sized mammals and, and medium and small uh, birds. And our study design, as I told you, uh, we are doing this project in the in the Doña, Reserva Biológica de Doñana and to analyze the, the role of the interaction during the colonization processes, we have selected uh, three different uh, plots in the Doñana Biological Reserve. Uh, in a maturity gradient. It's uh, one of the population uh, represents or consists in the more well-established juniper population of, of Doñana, an intermediate one, and finally, the, the colonization front of the juniper plants. Uh, obviously, these populations differ in the, in the density of juniper individuals or in the demography. And in each one of these three plant stands, uh, to monitor individual uh, interaction, we have selected uh, 35 individuals per plant, which is a total of 105 focal plants, where we uh, have been focusing our, our interaction survey during two years of sampling. So the more the general uh, question of, of this project and what, what we want to answer uh, through the thesis chapter is how the plant animal interaction at the individual level are reshaped in the plant expansion scenario. In the first chapter, we are going to focus uh, in understand 
what is the role of the antagonistic interactions and what type of plant trades and network structures can change during the colonization processes. The second chapter is an homologous chapter in, in, where we want to, to understand the role of different frugivory animals in these colonization processes because there, there can be difference between the more mature stance of the frugivory, of the activity of the frugivory and the colonization front. And when we, when we can understand this balance between the antagonistic and the mutualistic interaction to test the first of our hypothesis about the, the, the imbalance in this, in this uh, balance, uh, we want to, in the chapter three, three we want to understand, we want to uh, answer questions more about the consequences of, of the activity of the frugivories in terms of the, the genetic patterns that, that they produce in complex landscapes. And finally, through the chapter fourth, using the multilayer network, we will analyze um, the whole patterns of, of interaction, different type of interaction in a more um, generalistic point of view. Well, I'm going to start with the description of the chapters, but before explaining the chapters one and two, this slide represents, uh, because these chapters are homologous chapters, this slide represents uh, uh, these two points that these uh, chapters have in common. The first of, uh, of these ones is um, a database of different traits of the plants that we are going to use to explain, to try to explain, uh, to, to test if the, the different plant traits can explain the network structures. For example, some uh, traits of the plant like the height or the crop size of the plant or traits about the cones of the plant, like for example, the fruit weight or the number of seeds are another traits of of the cones, like for example, the chemical compounds of the pulps. And this type of traits could determine the different animal preferences to, to interact at the, at the individual level. Another uh, immediate, immediate neighborhood uh, attributes, like for example, the neighborhood density or the neighborhood crop size. And with this type of biological information, we are going to analyze this one uh, by this analytical approach with this type of model, which is called individual random graph models. And this is um, homologous to a GLM model, to a classical GLM model. But in this case, the, the response variable uh, is the, the structure of the network itself. And the, the, the predictive variables are the, the more important point of this type of model is that we, we can include the, the traits that we have been in this data set, the traits of the different nodes of the network as predictive variables to understand what role have the, the traits of the plant in the structuring of the different uh, networks of interactions. So in, in, the, in the chapter one, where we study the individual effect of antagonists across the colonization gradient, in one hand, we have the, the plant and neighborhood attributes, and we had to collect uh, information about the different type of interactions that are having an, a fitness effect on, on, the, on the plants. And because we have a diverse assemblage of dispersal antagonistic interaction, we use different type of sampling methods for, for each type of, of interaction. For example, with the invertebrates uh, community, what we do is to collect 50 uh, cones per plant. And in the laboratory, we analyze the different um, invertebrates that are consuming the pulp or the or the seeds of the plants, and with this information, uh, we could, can unravel the the different species that are feeding here by uh, using to the the signals of their interactions they present or the community of parasitoids and hyperparasitoids that act uh, that are uh, in in the in the plant fruits. The other uh, type of interactions is the, is the activity of the finches, the green finches that in juniper plants, they used to pick the, the cones to feed on their, on their seed. They broke the seeds and, and feed on the embryo of the seeds. And for, to determine the, the strength of the interaction, we are combining uh, two methods. In one case, a uh, field uh, survey of the, of the effects of the, of the finches and combine it with, with a phototrapping survey. 
and in the case of the rodents uh, that they used to feed to in the pulp and mostly in the in the seeds of the plant uh, we combine here also uh, two methods uh, the photo trapping again and a field uh, trapping of the of the animals that help us to identify the two species that are interacting with the with the juniper plant and with this interaction information and the plant attributes what we want to do is to to build and this is the point that we are uh, in the, in this moment we are in this point to build the interaction networks of different type of animals interacting with with the 105 plant to test uh, what is the most important changes of the antagonistic effect during the colonization processes and through the ERGM models we want to test what is the effect of the plant trait uh, in this network structure to detect different preferences of the of the antagonistic animals and the second point to compare the effect of the antagonistic animals and the mutualistic animals is the the study of this chapter four two which is the study of the individual effect of mutualists across the colonization gradient and here we also we also have the the plant trade database and we need to collect information about the the animals the Fujibori animals that are visiting uh, our, our focal plants and feeding in their fruits. And to do that, we combine two sampling methods. Uh, in one hand, the DNA barcoding methods that uh, shortly consist in uh, collect feces of the animals that visit the plants by seed traps. And in the laboratory, we amplify the animal DNA that con contains the external part of the feces and we sequence this this dna material to cross it with with reference sequences and this technique allow us to know which specific uh, animal uh, have been visited each of our focal plants and this is very useful for the bird species but we uh, combine this this dna barcoding with an exhaustive photo trapping survey that is more useful in the case of the of the mammal species and with this information what we want to do again is to to build the interaction networks in the three colonization stage because here maybe it's better uh, here in this figure oh, this is only an illust uh, a temporary figure but i collapse our 105 plants but what we want to do is to to build three networks in the three plant stands to test what is the differences of the network structures across this this colonization gradient and if the role of the of the Fujibori animals is the same but this i i put here in this presentation this slide uh, just uh, to show you for example the central role that some uh, Fujibori species have like the common thrush that practically interact with all the 105 plants or the robin that are here next to the, the the thrush but also other mammal species like for example the red fox that that also uh, have a very central role mm. while uh, there are other fujibori animals or the red points that not interact with mm, all the plants that they just to inter they just interact with a subset of the plants and the same occurs in the case of the of the plants there are plants that have a, a very fat gray line, a, a, a high strength of the interaction with Fujibori animals, uh, while there are other plants that have a little uh, strength with these with these animals. And when we final, when we will final this chapter, we want to to test what happened with the balance between the mutualistic and antagonistic animals. And when we know what is the role of different Fujibori species in the third chapter we want to test the genetic patterns in the seed grain generated by these Fujibori animals in heterogeneous landscapes. And to do that, the, the first step that we, that we did is to classify the places uh, of, in, in, land, in, the, in the field where a seed could be dispersed in, in, what, in what we call microhabitats. And this is, for example, open area microhabitats. This is, sorry, this is the sandy soil, or under a pinus pinea, 
under Juniper Poenicea plants or under non-fleshy or fleshy fruited species. And why this, this um, classification is important for, for our questions? The first point is that different uh, frugivorous animals have different preferences to occupy this type of microhabitat micro or to disperse the uh, seeds in this type of microhabitat. Micro For example, uh, the red fox or the mammals commonly use the non fleshy species to, to delimit their, their camp area. But there are other species like, for example, the black birds or the robins that commonly use uh, other type of areas like Pinus pinea or, or under a juniper plant. So this is the classification of the microhabitat. This is important because the preferences of the frugivory animals and this is important from the seed point of view too, because mm, from, this is not the same. The probabilities of germination, um, for example, the summer survival of the seeds, it could be very different under different type of micro microhabitats. For example, from a, a seedling point of view, this is not the same to, to survive of the, to the summer in Doñana in an open area um, microhabitat than, for example, under a juniper plant. So what we do in this point, and the, the, the question that we have is, what is the genetic patterns generated by frugivories in this uh, different type of mic microhabitats? So what we do is, again, collect uh, feces in different uh, microhabitats, and we are doing DNA barcoding of these feces to, to know the different frugivory preferences and to know we, uh, each feces from uh, which animal uh, is. And with this feces, what we do is to uh, collect the seeds that some of these feces contain. And by, by extracting the maternal DNA that the endocarp of the seed uh, contains, we are able to, to genotypize this, this, this maternal DNA because this part of the seed only contains uh, DNA of the maternal trees that produce the seeds. So with this inform with this information, we are able, to, for example, in this illustrative uh, figure, it, this could be a, an exactly point, uh, sample point of the field on the, all the seeds that have been arriving here during the two years of, of survey. For example, uh, these two black stars, could, these two seeds could uh, come from the same mother plant and the yellow one from another one and the gray one, so the same. And with this type of information about the, the, the contribution of different mothers to its uh, micro microhabitat provided by the activity, the, the feeding activity or the feeding strategies and the position patterns of the produce species, we want to, can to calculate some maternal genetic metrics, like for example, the maternal richness that informs us about the different number of mothers uh, that contribute to this place or the, re the, the familiar relatedness between different uh, seeds or the correlated maternity in this point. And from our uh, object, is, this is useful because the, the genetic structure generated in, in, in the landscape is gonna inform us about how is gonna be the future genetic structure of the population. And we, are, we want to link this future genetic um, promoted or derivated by the frugivory uh, activity. And the last chapter uh, is the multilayer chapter. Um, it is called complex integration patterns analysis with multilayer network. And to introduce in, uh, multilayer network, I put here this figure uh, provided by Philsoph and collaborators. And here they uh, theoretically describe the different type of multilayer network that will be used in the in ecological research. And the more important point to understand how this type of network uh, works, this is, this is the, the combination of different type of networks and different networks are linked between them by the interlayer links. And for example, here, each layer in this temporal multi-network 
each layer represent a specific uh, uh, time moment of a, of a sampling. For example, a, a sampling day in our in an in a study, or for example, in a spatial multilayer network, each layer could represent, for example, different type of habitats, and in each layer, uh, the different animals are interacting, and we have. This is the same, like a classical bipartite network, but for example, between habitats, animal can move. And we can, we can calculate different type of network metrics combining the information of the different layers. And this is the shared species uh, multilayer. This is the approach that we want to use. And the, the specific type of this type of approach is that the, there are some nodes that are shared between different layers. Here in this, in this uh, temporally uh, figure, I can show, show you better. For example, here I am showing the just only for 35 uh, juniper plants, the interaction with the vertebrate herbivory community and the same 35 plants that here are interacting with the vertebrate community. We, we see here these gray lines that represent the interaction of each plant with the with the vertebrate animals, the same plant that are interacting here are again linked within itself by the interlayer links here interacting with the predispersal uh, corner vivory animals. And the same occur, the same plant here we have interacting with the with the seed dispersal community. And this type of approach, we want to use it because this allows us to, to unravel the more general patterns of the of the different type of, of networks that emerge of these complex systems to detect for example a group of species that used to interact uh, among them more commonly than other ones or a specific layer that could be more important in in terms of the fitness of the individuals because i didn't say it sorry but in our case the the strength or the value of the interlayer links is going to represent some measure or some value of the, the fitness effect that each type of interaction could have from each specific, uh, each specific plan to determine what is the final effect of the interactions uh, at the individual level. And what um, we want to, to do that in the three stands, in our three uh, study areas, from the mature stand, the intermediate one, and the colonization front to determine what is the more general patterns in the structuring of the networks during any plant movements. And finally, here I, I show uh, a timetable or the planning of, of this thesis. I, I already finished the, the two fieldwork seasons and now I am in the with the chapter with the analysis and writing of the chapter one, and with the laboratory work, uh, majorly with Cristina Rigueiro in the maternal DNA analysis, and with Juan Miguel Arroyo with the DNA barcoding analysis. And this is the the planning of the of the analysis and writing of the fourth chapter that that compound this thesis. So this is all, thank you very much. And thank you also, especially to my supervisors, Pedro and Miguel, and all the people of the, of the Integrative Ecology Group. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jorge. Super nice talk, super clear. Congratulations. It was very cool. So I think people are gonna write very soon questions in the chat, but me and Wally, I wanted to ask you a few questions. Um, one of these questions is related with the fact that you are doing individual networks, right? You are using the, the plant for the plants. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know if you think that um, differences among individuals are gonna be higher than differences among stands, among different types of stands, or do you think the stand structure will be most important than really the differences among the individuals? Uh I don't really know yet where is gonna be the the, the variance, uh, but the, by the result that I show, I think that the the individual variation is gonna be 
very important explaining the the animal's preferences but the obviously the the place where a plant be and the the community the, the neighborhood plants and the stand configuration is going to determine i i think is going to determine the 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 interactions structuring okay and do you think for the future because you also have the, the for the barcoding dna dna barcoding you have also the information from the from the birds right so maybe yeah. you could also do a individual individual network from not only for the plants but also for the birds would be that possible technically or is it impossible mm, with this type of of dna material i don't think so because the the sequence that we can amplify from from each uh, species uh, sometimes it is not useful to determine the species so the the individual difference differentiation within a species uh, for this one you need a more uh, quality uh, information but this is a good point because maybe i don't know in the case of the of the birds i don't know but for example in, with mammal species that that have more more important effect during this, uh, for example, with uh, long distance dispersal and things like that during the plant mm -hmm. movement. This could be interesting, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, there are several questions in the chat as well, and I'm going to do them. If you have any question, like, uh, just let me know. So Christoph is asking, can the multi-layer approach be made be more than two-dimensional, for example? Could you have, oh, message retracted. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was reading it. <laughs> oh, anyhow. Anyway, I'm going to go to Anna's question. Anna says, Anna Benitez, pretty cool presentation and excellent research design with really exciting questions. So her question is, it is not clear to me what fitness variables are you going to be using for the interlayer links. Could you explain that in more detail? <laughs> yeah, this is a good question, Anna. Thank you for for the question. And this is one of the of the more uh, important challenge of of for me in this project and, and for us. And this is difficult to test with the specific uh, fitness effect um, for some some type of interaction. Because, for example, uh, in our case, what uh, I'm, we are thinking on start the the fitness consideration as the the initial crop size of the plant and the consecutive interaction that act in the plant in terms of the of the number of um, delayed seeds of, of the initial crop size or the positive effect is the dispersed seeds to detect how the effect of different interactions have on the on the probability of the of each plant to contribute to the to the seed dispersal think if Anna you have if you have any further uh, no but this is a good questions. question and for me the it is not easy to answer this because this is challenge for us it's very challenging okay so Christoph finally made his question okay so uh can the multi-layer approach be made be more than two-dimensional for example could you have time and path in the same model to test for time by habitat interactions I have never mm, seen it I don't know. Maybe with other type, in other type of of research uh, fields, uh, somebody uh, did that. But in ecology, I've never seen it. Mm, this type of approach is very young in ecology, and for for us, it's difficult to to apply this type of of um, metrics in with a biological sense. So, but maybe, maybe it's possible, but I don't know. Maybe uh, Irene could answer or... Yeah, so um, some, some, uh, maybe. I, maybe I can help a little bit because I'm also working with multi-layer networks. So the thing is you need to have a common element between the layers. So if you're using patch and time, you need to have something in common. For instance, you can have the same individuals across time and then, but they are not going to be in the same habitats right so it's but you can maybe find another way of connecting them maybe through this dispersal through divorce or whatever but you need the most important thing is to design what is the common elements between the, between the layers and then you need to parameterize this so it's not it's not easy but i don't think it's impossible it's just to, you need to focus it in a proper way to to, to to conceptualize that in a proper way 
So you yeah. basically need to have like a common point to link every layer. Yeah, yeah. And that is we, where it can become. I mean, not all, not all the points need to be the same in all the layers, but you need, to, you need to have something in common between the layers. So you need to, to maybe you can do a layer for the, for the time, like linking individuals and maybe for patches, linking words, for instance. But it's, I mean, you we, need, we should think more about that. But I don't think it's impossible. It's just more complex. More complex, yeah. So, and also he con congratulates you on your talk. He felt bad about that. That's why he <laughs> rejected his question. <laughs> so, Carlos, uh, thanks you very much for his presentation and then for your presentation, sorry. And then you apparently already answered his question. So he has a new question. How will productivity of each individual tree affect the network structure? No, the, the productivity in terms, I, I suppose, in crop size, no? In, I guess in, so, yeah. In pre-production. Well, we are going to test it uh, in the antagonistic and the mutualistic interaction by the ERGM models, because these models allow us to give, to use this type of, of plant individual information as a predictive variable to detect, for example, if the plants with bigger crop size and a more product, this is only an example, and a more productive neighborhood, uh, the probability of the link distribution in the layer uh, could be determined by this type of traits. So this is the implementation of this, term, of this type of plant information. So uh, I have a couple of questions as well that I would like to ask you. Okay. Uh, well, there is like a group of questions that are related and that refers mainly to chapter three and when you're going to be studying the genetic structure. Yeah. So in the beginning, when you made your, you, when you were describing your hypothesis and your framework, you mm. said that the feeding and the position patterns of the animals we're going to be affecting genetic structure of the plants, which it obviously makes sense. But you pointed out that it, it's going to affect them in heterogeneous environments. Yeah. So I don't know, do you think that would, I mean, I guess it would actually affect them. It doesn't matter what, what the environment is, right? You are mm -hmm. just saying it in the heterogeneous environments because that's going to be your focus. Mm, not, mm, not mm, because, the point of this uh, heterogeneous environment classification is because in from the a seed that have been dispersed from a seed point of view, the probabilities of germination and successful establishment could uh, vary very much between different habitats. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. and the the preferences of the of the animals vary very much too between different uh, microhabitats. So to understand better the, the patterns generated by frugivory animals, this classification can help us to detect the, the consequences of each frugivory groups uh, dividing the, the habitat in these microhabitats. Okay, and regarding with that, I mean, it obviously makes sense. It, that, it, it really matters where you put that seed because the humidity, the sunlight and everything is going to be different. Yeah. So in your networks, you are considering who is moving and what the animal is doing, but you are not considering those environmental factors, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We, we are, we are uh, not testing, but we are measuring the different humidity and temperature condition in this microhabitat to, uh, to understand, but uh, through the germination experiments that we are doing in the field, uh, okay. to test what is the probabilities of, of establishment of the seeds, we can test about uh, what is the, the abiotic factors that vary between different microhabitats. Okay, that would be nice because you could incorporate all the landscape matrix. And then, do you actually expect to find a strong population structure? Because it seems to me that it's a very small area, right? So it would yeah. be, do you expect yeah. to find... It is uh, it is difficult because when 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 approach the the network studies with with the individual point of view, it yes. is you have to uh, it's very time consuming to have information at the individual level of the plant. So mm -hmm. we try to maximize the number of, of, of focal plant, but the the effort in in each plant during two years is very high. So. Uh, 
this is the maximum that for a test that could be could be done. But I think that we are going to 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 see, for example, uh, the data that we I observed during these two years. Uh, I think that there are many differences uh, within plants in a population and within population. For example, population. Some, some animals like the green finches have a very clear preference from one of the from the colonization front area. And then now I have a very simple methodological question. So you were saying that photo trapping was more useful than DNA metabar coding for mammals than for birds. Why is that? Mm, this combination of, of methods is a bit uh, tricky, but uh, in this, in our case, some, we use seed traps under the plants to collect the feces from the birds that go to feed in, in the plant. But many, many mammal species do not use, or if they use, this is a not natural use of the habitat for the position. So the, the photo trap allow us to detect the interaction of these mammals uh, um, without have the, the physical yeah. and then they can go and poop somewhere else yeah. <laughs> okay that makes sense thank you very much like everyone is congratulating you on your talk Maria Jose Veronica they think it's I think it's really nice thank so you. far we don't have more questions in the chat so if you Agus or Irene want to make any more questions No, I don't think that. I, I think that you. I had the same the same curiosity as you, Maria, Maria Jesus. I, I was I was curious about how the the heterogeneity in the landscape will be addressed in the in the analysis. But I think that he he answered pretty well. Jorge, for the ERGM models, uh, I think you can also include these abiotic variables, right? Yes, but the, these abiotic variables in the ERGM models, the nodes that we are going to have is the 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 animal nodes and the the plant traits and the abiotic uh, condition uh, differ between microhabitats by from an individual point of view. Uh, this is difficult because what is the abiotic condition of each plant? Yeah, I mean, if you are super yeah, interested, you can also measure that. But I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah, I guess that I was thinking more in, so now when you're explaining, it made more sense. So I tend to think more in terms of population genetics, which yeah. means that I have the population structure, I have the different habitats and landscape genetics, you can overlap those things. But you are looking more at the, inter at like the individual level. So hmm. that's why it is a slightly different. So they are complementary approaches, but it's a slightly different. Now we have more questions in the in the chat, so <laughs> I can then to you. So Anna is asking, how comparable are different methodologies to record interactions? I can imagine that some are more efficient than others. Do you need to standardize? I guess it refers to the image of our coding and camera trap. Yeah. This is a very good question and, and a challenge that we have in our group. Uh, very, this is a very commonly challenge uh, because many uh, frugivore studies and other type of uh, interaction studies uh, used to maximize the data production using different methods. And the, the, the way that we use uh, to merge, to the merge, data merging could be very different. For example, you can standardize sometimes by, by the sampling effort. For example, the, the, the timing or the area that each metal survey or other more mathematical uh, standardization, like for example, taking in account the, the ranking in each different type of, of, of data sets of each survey to collapse all the information in a more general database of interaction that uh, just informs us about the ranking of the interaction. Mm -hmm. No, but this, this is difficult. Yeah, I guess it's very difficult, very different approaches. So Jennifer Leonard C has another question as well. So she says, you mentioned that the most common mammalian interactions were with red fox. Yeah. What other mammals do you observe? In our case, uh, we just observed the red fox and uh, yeah, I say feeding on the plant because the photo trapping uh, survey we have all the, the mammals of Doñana. But feeding on the plant, we just find uh, the red fox. I think that the wild boar, but this is not very common in the in the Sabinares, and uh, the badger. Badger. Okay. 
And yeah, Gemma Trigo congratulates you as well on the topic and your thesis and she wishes good luck. Mm -hmm. So if you guys have any further questions, you can write them in the chat or otherwise we can close it. Yeah, I think you have a fantastic thesis project, Jorge. It's not because you are in my group. <laughs> it's not only for that. <laughs> But I think it's a very complex thesis. You combine field work with uh, genetic analysis with super complex also statistical design and models. So I think it's very challenging, but it's really, very, really cool. So congratulations. I hope you will have a lot of success. <laughs> Thank you, Renee. I think you <laughs> all to organize these seminars and give me the opportunity to present. Yeah, you are very welcome. And I, so next week, we are going to have uh, Maria Panif for uh, the next EBD seminars. And um, yeah, and then we will have a gap for, for the Holy Week for Easter time. But uh, please come next week also for the next one. And um, thank you so, so much and goodbye. Goodbye.